Hello, Peer family. Welcome to our online service. And if you're new today, we want to welcome you. My name's Jason. We've got a great service in store today. We're excited to be journeying together through the Lent season. We're into our second week of Lent, second week in our new series on Lent. And we've got a time of worship together, a time of reading scripture, time of prayer. So I'm glad that you're with us. Now, before we get started, I wanted to give some announcements to kind of let you know of some things that are happening in our community. The big one is that today is our ACM. It's our annual congregational meeting. That's going to be this afternoon at 1.30, and it's at Zoom. Or sorry, it's on Zoom. And we've sent out the link, the Zoom link for that uh, via email. So if you didn't get one of those and you'd like to attend, you can email us at info at the peer dot church and we'll get that link to you. And also we've sent out the reports and the minutes from last year to your email. Um, if you didn't get those and you'd like to, then feel free to email us about those as well. And you know what? I wanted to mention something just around this time of year. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how the peer, like where your, your donations go, where your offerings and your, your givings go, um, because budget is certainly part of the conversation. Finances are certainly part of the conversation around the ACM time of year. And many of you know this, but maybe some of you don't, that something that I love about the peer that's special about our community is that we really believe in giving back and supporting others. So 30% of what comes in from your, your gifts and your donations, that actually goes right back out. And so 30% goes overseas um, to missionaries and causes overseas, as well as causes and missionaries here at, in Canada, here at home, and even at home to compassion initiatives. Um, palliative care, actually, our donation to palliative care would be an example of that, of something here at home. So I just wanted to let you know that, that when you're giving to the peer, um, you're also giving to others. You're partnering with us as we support these things and these people. And so a reminder about that, if you'd like to give, you can go to our website, thepeer.church, nice and easy. And there you'll find uh, across the top, there's a section for giving. It just says give on it. Also, you can e-transfer and uh, you can e-transfer to give at thepeer.church. Great. Well, on that note, also what I wanted to do today was uh, pray again for all that's going on in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Our hearts go out to, to those that are suffering in this, um, t this terrible time there. And also, we wanted to find a way to support. Um, some of you have been asking me, can we collect a donation for uh, humanitarian efforts um, involving the people who are being forced from their homes in the Ukraine. And so actually we're part of the BIC denomination and something, an, um, an offshoot of that or in a compassionate arm of the BIC is the MCC, uh, known as the Mennonite Central Committee. And they've actually, they've got a lot of contacts in and around Ukraine. So they're actually taking donations uh, to help out in the Ukraine. And here's what, um, here's just a little bit about that. It says that they're responding to the crisis in Ukraine. It says the MCC will be responding to the crisis in Ukraine through its local partners. Our prayers and donations will help partners scale up their work, providing relief and trauma healing for vulnerable and displaced people. So rather than take a collection through the peer, what we'd like to do is just send you to the MCC page and specifically the MCC donation page so you can donate directly to them and uh, to help out um, in, this, uh, in this initiative. So the website for that is mcco.ca forward slash Ukraine and the information's up on the screen. Great. We wanted to make sure that we are doing all that we can uh, to help in this time. And why don't we, on that note, I'd like to take a moment before we move into our time of worship. I'd like to take a, a moment to pray for the situation there. Dear Heavenly Father, it's hard to know how to pray at a time like this. And I think a time like this, our, our trust in you and our faith in you, Lord Jesus, uh, it, it just becomes all the more significant. And Holy Spirit, you know what to pray for. Sometimes when we're without words, 
you can pray for us. So Holy Spirit, we trust in you and we, we trust you to provide words to our fears, provide words to our concern, provide words to our grief and our heartache. We pray, Holy Spirit, that, that you would, would pray for us in this way, in prayers of power for the people of Ukraine, the victims, the, the innocent victims there. We pray for protection. We pray for peace. We pray for a quick end to this needless conflict. We trust you, Heavenly Father, now and always. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You make 
before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness, and all I did was pray. It was wishing, and all I did was bow down, and all I did was stay still. Hallelujah, you have said. To find your truth, your mercy is the shade I'm living in. You restore my faith and hope again, and all I did was praise, and all I did was worship. Picked up all my pieces, put me back.
So we are into week two of Lent and week two in our series on Lent. This series is really helping us to, to examine ourselves, to reflect, and to think about and pray about some of the things that we might need to let go of because Lent is a time often of, of letting things go. And so things we might need to let go of in order to make ro- more room for Jesus, to make more room to follow Jesus more deeply and to enter into the rest that he offers, that rest that we talked about last week where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, those who are w- weary and, and heavy laden and, or burdened, and I will give you rest, rest for your soul. So we're, that's our big theme. And I'm really looking forward to what we're going to be talking about today. Today, it's all about letting go of fear, letting go of the things that maybe close our hearts off to the new things that maybe God wants to do in our lives. And this brings to mind a a story from my life. And I want to get vulnerable with you today in the hopes that as you're sharing with others, maybe as you're in your peer groups talking about this, this might inspire you to be vulnerable as well. (laughs) But I want to tell you a story about uh, a time when Randy and I were dating. And this was a, a really important time, especially for me. It was a real turning point in our relationship. Prior to this, I definitely um, suffered from what you might call fear of commitment. I mean, Randy was all in and I struggled to take that, that next step. I mean, we were best friends. I knew I had strong feelings for her. But there was just like this baggage, this in, these internal fears that were that were holding me back I mean like I said I knew I had strong feelings but for some reason as we got more serious I would be thinking things like I just I just need to be sure you know and how can you be sure and do I have the right feelings and are they strong enough and am I ready and all of that so these questions and feelings all came together to bring that fear fear of going all in fear of of uh, working towards marriage and I, I can remember one day where this really changed. One day in particular, that was a major turning point for me. And actually, Randy and I were watching that great movie from, I think it was from the 90s, called As Good As It Gets. And it's got, so it's starring Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. And Jack Nicholson is kind of this older guy who's had trouble in relationships, really because of his fear of commitment. And he's dating Helen Hunt, and things are going really well. In fact, things seem to be going quite well. But then he hits this rocky point. Actually, I think it's more than once, if I remember right. But especially this one point, you think that things are going to, that they're going to get married, or they're going to, you know, he's all in. But then all of a sudden, he breaks it off. And you wonder what's going to happen. You wonder if it, their relationship is going to survive. Well, thankfully, by the end of it, he comes to his senses and uh, things all really work out well in the end. But I can remember when I was watching that, it kind of was like a nice slap across the face <laughs> because I, I saw myself in that character. And I thought, man, that guy, he's pretty old and he's still struggling with this and look he's he's lonely especially that point when you don't know how it's going to turn out he's just really lonely and sad and it was like I do not want to turn out like that I need to smarten up or I'm going to turn out like that and as he had his realization that he deep down he did really love uh the other the character Helen Hunt plays um it's just that his fears were holding him back I kind of went through the same realization I realized yeah I do really love Randy. It's just that these fears are holding that back, holding me back from making a commitment. And so after the movie, I turned to Randy, the romantic that I was, but still the <laughs> working on that fear of commitment, not, not able to just m- go the full plunge. I said to her, rather than, I love you, I said, I think I love you. <laughs> but that was a turning point. That was a turning point for me because from there, giving up, just saying, just letting go. Finally, I said, I'm letting go of those fears. It's like they kind of vanished. And actually, in letting those things go, I found that assurance that I was looking for. I found a peace and assurance about our relationship, which enabled me to go all in. And I was able to commit And as you know, we got married and actually I've never had a problem with those fears again. So it was a beautiful, amazing turning point. Now, we're going to be 
going through Matthew and we're going to be reading from chapter 19 and we're going to be reading about an encounter between a group who's certainly struggling with fears and things that are holding them back from following Jesus. This group is the Pharisees. They it, We're reading about an encounter between the Pharisees and Jesus. And we're doing that because it's a chance for us to learn from the Pharisees, especially from their mistakes, to look at them and examine ourselves and say, are there things that I see in them that are present in myself, myself things that I need to let go of? And after this scene, there's the beautiful scene of Jesus with the little children coming to him and him saying that, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So we're going to reflect on that by way of conclusion as well and, and ask, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean to be like little children? And just kind of hinting at what, it, what I see happening here is that, that this is a, a call to be open to the newness of what God is doing, to, to a new start, letting, letting go of the past and ready for what's new and trusting Jesus through the process. So we're going to be talking about all that today, and I'm really looking forward to it, especially the questions that we're going to ask. I know for me, kind of, as I've been preparing, this has been really powerful, and I'm trust, trusting that it's going to be the same for you. So let's first start out by reading the passage, and we're going to read the whole thing from uh, so it's Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 15, and I'm going to be reading the NRSV translation. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he cured them there. Some Pharisees came to him, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Well, they said to him, Why then did Moses give us a command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? Well, Jesus said to them, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. Well, his disciples said to Jesus, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can accept this teaching but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs. In other words, they've chosen not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. All right. So this scene is a point where Jesus has been been in his public ministry for a little while now and as you can tell he's really become well known there's large crowds that are following Jesus at this point and he's been traveling through Galilee and now he's heading into Judea with the destination eventually being Jerusalem which is kind of like the capital of Israel it's where the temple is it's kind of the center uh, center point of Israel and it, I love it how it says that these large crowds are following Jesus. And what does he do? He's stopping to heal them. He's showing compassion on the crowds. Well, there's another group that comes to Jesus as well. The Pharisees come to him. And it's a very different type of encounter. It says here that the Pharisees came to test Jesus. Test him by asking him something. And that word for test, it, it basically, they want to see what Jesus is all about. And they, they want to know the answer because they're going to judge him by the answer. They're kind of testing his character, testing him on where he's coming from. We're going to explore that a little bit more. Um, but that's kind of what that word means. And before we get into what the test is, I just want to pause right there for a second. Because when I hear that word test, and, and this isn't the first place it's happened, by the way. It's happened elsewhere in Matthew. In Matthew, let me find it here. In Matthew 6, 
the Pharisees have done the same thing. They've come to Jesus, testing him. It says there they wanted a sign. They wanted to test him. Prove your credentials, basically. Give us a sign. And it's going to happen again in Matthew 22. So this isn't the only place where the Pharisees are testing him. This is a theme. And I think it's not a stretch to say that there's some serious irony going on here because it calls to mind a really important uh, event in Israelite history when the Israelites tested God. So let me just go there for a second so you see what I mean. I think it's worthwhile going through this. So if we go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 17, we see the, the, uh, the account of this incident. So let me set the stage quickly. This is um, just after God has saved the Israelites from Egypt. He's just freed them from Egypt. They're about a month beyond that, and they're traveling through the wilderness. And to their minds, things aren't going the way that they hoped because it's hot. They've been out without water for a while. They're starting to worry that they've come out here only to die of dehydration. So they get angry. They get really angry with Moses. In fact, the wording there, it's like they basically want to try Moses and, and give him the death sentence because they feel like he's kind of betrayed them or something like that. Well, Moses' response is this to them. He says, quiet, when he realizes what's happening. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? That's chapter 17, verse 2. Well, as the story goes, God really comes through, but, and, and, but this wasn't like a happy story, even though God saves them. Moses calls this place that it happens Massa and Meribah, which means to contend and to test. Because the idea is that the Israelites contended with Moses there. They, they argued with him and they were ready to, to put him to death and they tested the Lord. So it was a very memorable moment. And this also gets talked about at a really crucial place. There's this in, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, 16, one of the most important parts of the law, it brings up this very scene. And it says, you must not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. That's like really one of the central passages in the law. So, Let's go back to Matthew here. Let's go back to the Pharisees. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Matthew is trying to say, look at what these Pharisees are doing. They claim to be following the law. They came to be faithful to God, but they're actually testing God. We know as the readers, we know that Jesus is the son of God. We know that Jesus is specially sent by God. And in fact, we know that he's God himself. The Pharisees don't realize it, but they're reenacting that scene back in Exodus and they're breaking one of the heart passages of the law, the very law that they claim to follow so diligently. So there's a lot of irony there right off the bat with the Pharisees coming to test Jesus. And you know what? I wonder, let's just think about that for a second. If we can think about that and apply it to our own lives. Basically, the Pharisees are behaving in a way that's contradicting some of their really core values. And how, I, w I wonder if there's, if we reflect, if there's some things that God wants to bring to mind for us, where maybe we're in our behaviors or our, our patterns of thinking, maybe we're being counter to things that we know to be um, valuable and, and good. Uh, maybe we're not breaking full out commandments. Maybe it's not something that's immoral or things like that. But yeah, maybe the way that we're using our time is like going contrary to the way we would really want <laughs> to use our time. It's not serving the kind of priorities and values that we've set. Or maybe there's patterns of thinking that we have that are really counterproductive to what we know God wants for us. So Maybe it's a, this is a chance to, to reflect on that, to learn from the mistakes here of the Pharisees and, and ask God, what are some things that, that we need to let go of so we can get back on track? Okay, well, let's move on here. So let's talk about now what the test is, because this is important too. Basically, the Pharisees want to test Jesus on a certain part of the law, and it's to do with divorce. 
So they're asking Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? And there's a few things going on in the background here because they're referring to the Old Testament law to the Torah. Because in Deuteronomy, it says that if a man marries a woman and she does not please him because he has found something indecent in her, then he may draw up a divorce document, give it to her, and evict her from his house. That's Deuteronomy 24.1. Well, you might, if you think about it, there's a bit of a vague term there. When it says, um, it, it says that you, the man can divorce his wife because he's found something indecent in her, that's a bit vague. So not only are the Pharisees referring to that, but they're also referring to a debate that was going on for quite some time now about how to properly interpret that. And actually, there's two really prominent scholars of the first century BC that debated this very thing. So their names are Shammai and Hillel. So these are very prominent scholars. And actually the Pharisees would be following Hillel, but they, those two, um, took very different interpretations of this and taught very different ways of following this. So Shammai took a more strict and rigid approach. His approach was that, no, we really need to narrow that down. And basically, something indecent means something like adultery or that sort of thing. That's the only reason that a man can divorce his wife. But Hillel really opened it up wide so that a man could really divorce his wife for almost any reason, as the Pharisees alluded to there, any and every reason, even to the point where basically if he didn't like her cooking, that was enough to divorce her. So the Pharisees are siding more on the side of Hillel, but they'd like Jesus to weigh in on this. They're testing him. Which side are you going to go on? Are you going to be on our side or not? There's one more dimension to this too, because there's a political dimension as well. The Pharisees know that Herod, if he were to find out, if Jesus were to answer this in, a, in the wrong way, he'd be upset. If you read just a little bit prior, John the Baptist had been put into prison and put to death because he crossed Herod on this very question. John the Baptist had been telling Herod, you can't be with the woman that you're with because it's adultery. You were married and this doesn't count. That there's no grounds for divorce here. You shouldn't be with the woman you, that you are with. And Herod put him into prison and eventually put him to death because of that. So I'm sure the Pharisees also, they're wanting to trap him here. Some translations say they wanted to entrap him because of that. They, they, they're hoping, he says something that they can bring back to Herod so that he can arrest him and kind of do their dirty work for them because by this point, they want Jesus out of the picture. They want him dead. So those things are operating in the background when they come to Jesus to ask him about divorce. Well, to put it briefly, Jesus basically schools them in scripture and, and he ends up getting to the heart of the issue. Basically, he tells them, look, the reason why you see Moses saying that is because of your hard hearts. He was making like a provision for your hard heartedness. So he's getting at the root issue here. And he also, he says, but I say to you. So the Pharisees, they're saying Moses commanded. They're appealing to Moses as the authority. And then, but Jesus says, well, Moses said it because of that. But I say to you, in other words, he's operating with a higher authority or claiming a higher authority than Moses. Well, this would have doubly hit the Pharisees. It would hit them big time in two ways. First off, the charge of being hard hearted would have been a strike to the ego, to say the least. But also, this would have challenged their foundations. So, the Pharisees are certainly faced with a dilemma. Let me just talk about that second one for a second. The, the Pharisees are definitely faced with a dilemma when it comes to Jesus, right? Because he's gaining a large following. He's very influential. They're seeing him cure people, do miracles. He's been casting out demons. All things that you'd think someone from God um, would, would, would prove that, that someone has come from God, that, that someone has been sent by God. So they can't ignore that part. But this very person is also challenging them in some very key areas. 
the Pharisees, as you probably know, were all about the rules. They believed wholeheartedly that you need to strictly follow the Torah, follow the commandments, and especially, and also their kind of tradition of interpretation of the Torah. It's all about following those things. And if you read through the different encounters between them and Jesus, Jesus keeps breaking their rules. And here, now, he's laying this charge that, you know what? You aren't following the heart of the rules either because your heart is hardened. Essentially, he is challenging their whole value system. And so he's challenging something that's very near and dear. It's like a core identity thing that he's challenging them on. You pair that up with all he's been doing, and that's a major threat to them. So by doing that, to have their value system challenged in that way, it would have brought out fear in them insecurity. They're thinking this isn't safe. So they're really in like fight or flight mode, so to speak. And the fight (laughs) instinct, you see how that is definitely coming out in full swing. I wonder if that sounds familiar here because when we put it that way, we realize that there's some things that are really preventing them from letting go. Their fears would have been working overtime to prevent them from opening themselves up to Jesus and letting go. The fact that their hearts are, are hardened and, and Jesus getting, getting at that core issue, they, they can't open themselves up to what Jesus is doing. They just can't let go. And how often, I wonder, do we find that, you know, where there's things God wants to take us in a new direction, but it's challenging us that bit too much where our fears are getting in the way. Or where there's, there's things that, that are keep preventing us from opening our heart to God. Because that, that whole idea of being hard-hearted, that speaks to what Jesus came to do, to soften the hearts of humanity with God's love and help open up our hearts to God's love. And in turn, so that we might love each other. So there we're talking about the healing process that Jesus wants to take each of us on. And and this is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. So there's bound to be things along the way, kind of a holdover from the old ways where it's holding us back. We're closing off our hearts again. Our hearts are hardened to something new that Jesus wants to do. And so that's why this is a continual process of of letting go of of the old things, of surrendering, of of Jesus saying, dying to the old me. And so it's a chance, I think, for us to ask ourselves that and to really reflect and, and pray, are there things, are there fears that are holding us back? Please, God, show us if there's fears that are holding us back. Or please, God, show us if there's something we gotta surrender, something so that we can open up our hearts again. That's why I started off that story about uh, me and, and Randy. There was certainly things that I needed to let go of so I could open up my heart to her. It's similar to our relationship with God. Well, before we finish, um, I wanted to mention the passage about little children because uh, this, is, this is so beautiful and it really ties things up nicely. So in the next passage, it says this, Then little children were brought to him for him to lay his hands on them and pray. But the disciples scolded those who brought them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not try to stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And he placed hands on them and went on his way. Well, the disciples here, the little children are coming to Jesus. The parents are sending them. And the disciples, they try and keep them, uh, keep them away from Jesus. I mean, basically, they're acting out their culture here. Not all cultures um, treasure kids in the same way that we do now. So they're just kind of like doing what they think would be natural. Don't bother Jesus. Don't, you know, keeping the kids away from him. But it's beautiful. That's why this passage is so well known. Jesus goes against the culture He's all, never afraid to go against the, the cultural taboos that are just preventing love from happening. He says, let them come to me. And he says that beautiful line, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Well, we've talked a little bit about that. Last week we said how 
uh, being like a little child is, is about trust. It's, it's like, you know, how, how kids, they just throw themselves in their parents' arms. Well, it's that kind of a picture where we're just willing to throw ourselves into the loving, merciful lap of the Father and trust God. But also, another um, part we could add here, especially in this context, is, is being open to new things and to a new start because certainly kids represent that they don't have the old baggage they're not held back by traditions and that sort of thing so they're ready for a new start they're always ready and excited for discovering new things that's one of the beautiful things of children i see that in my kids all the time the things that we might even overlook as as like mundane they're looking at and thinking that's beautiful never seen that before that's what it means to be a kid. Jesus actually talks about this later on when he's talking about what it means to be a child. Matthew 18, 2 to 5. So you can check that out um, as well to read a bit more deeply into it. But I think that's pretty key here. Being open to that new start, that new thing that Jesus wants to do. That's a key part of being a little child. And isn't that just such a contrast to the Pharisees? I don't think this is here by accident. I don't think Matthew's putting this scene here by accident. I think we're meant to contrast the Pharisees with these little children. Because certainly the fear, that hard-heartedness, it's preventing the Pharisees from being like this. They don't want to let go. They can't let go of their traditions, of their way of doing things. And Jesus is saying, but you need to order to inherit the kingdom to to be in the kingdom you got to let it go you got to be like a little child trusting god being open to the new things that god is doing so that's our last set of questions then can we learn from this scene with the little children are there things that god wants us to let go of so we can be ready for those new things that god wants to do because that's what i've found as I, the year, over the years of, of following Jesus, there's a lot of newness, <laughs> if you know what I mean. There's a lot of new things that happen. God is, is always creative. And so it's, I need to trust and I need to be ready for those new things. And it, so it never stops. And there's always the fears that come in, always the things that might prevent us from taking those new steps, that, from opening ourselves up. But we got to be ready to let those things go. And become like a little child again, trusting God, excited for what new thing he's going to do. So that's a prayer, I think. Continuing to ask God to, to show us how can we become like little children. And I think that's a, a definite question in prayer for us as the peer community as well. I mean, I'm pretty new here, so it's a different situation for me. But many of you have been around the peer for quite some time. So you know where the peer has come from and, and kind of seeing where we're going. So I wonder if we can ask that question. Are there things that God is saying, yeah, you know what, it's, it's been awesome for a while, that thing that we've been doing or have done, but it, maybe he's asking us to let that go so we can make room for the new things that God wants to do. But certainly there's other things that we can treasure and hold, uh, hold near and dear to our hearts as enduring things as well. But just a, a wonderful, I think, chance to ask that. And I, I would love to hear about your conversations in your peer groups about that. Great. So I'm going to finish off there now. And we've been looking and mining this story so that we can learn from the characters in it, right? We've been talking about the Pharisees, this group of little children. It's a chance for us to learn from, from the Pharisees what, what really not to do, right? Are there things that are holding us back? Are there things we need to let go of so that we can enter into a deeper relationship with Jesus, making ourselves again like little children, opening our hearts to the new things that God wants to do? And the beautiful thing about all of this and maybe the tragedy of the Pharisees is that as we let go, as we surrender the old, as we open ourselves to the new, we find what we're looking for. We find the rest that we so long for, the peace and the joy that we so desire. And it's all by letting go and making more room for Jesus. Great. I want to pray for us before we finish off. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you so much 
for your great love for us. And I thank you for your patience as we struggle often to let things go. And sometimes you revisit something again and again, asking us to let it go. Knowing, seeing things on the other side, that if we just do it, then we'll feel so much better and it'll open up so many new avenues that we didn't even dream of. So thank you for your patience in this. But we just pray now that you would show us individually. Show us if there's things that, fears that might be holding us back. Show us if there's things in relation to what Jesus called a hard heart that might be holding us back. And prompt us, Holy Spirit, give us the strength to let those things go. Also, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would show us what it means to be like little children. Are there things that, that we need to let go of so that we can be ready for the new things that you want to do. So we pray that you continue to shape us in these ways, and we desire, Lord Jesus, that rest that you speak of. We desire to put on your yoke, your beautiful, um, loving uh, arms uh, around us, I've heard it said, that, that we can think of it that way. So we just want to trust you, Jesus, and we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to when we can be together again uh, next week. God bless. Bye.